hear me okay with this? Okay. Yeah, so the, as uh, Paolo just said, that's the overall topic of my uh, lectures. The, they'll be divided into four parts, although, uh, well, they'll be a fair amount packed into the first two, so if I don't quite finish, I, I'll have a little bit of uh, time here. So what I'm going to do today is, uh, well, give you the basic results on event horizon, well, definition of black holes and event horizons and their properties. Completely separate topic of killing horizons, which, however, then will get merged together with this, uh, with, well, the Hawking rigidity theorem. Uh, the next lecture, this will be mostly pictures. This will be mostly general formulas that arise from the Lagrangian formulation of a theory, uh, which will, the main goal of which will be to derive the first law of black hole mechanics and thereby also give a general formula for black hole entropy. That will be valid actually in completely general theories of gravity that are diffeomorphism covariant, not just general relativity. Uh, then I'm going to get into a little bit more uh, uh, applications of this, uh, in fact, showing that dynamic stability of a black hole is, in fact, equivalent to its thermodynamic stability. And then finally, although this is not a course in quantum field theory and, uh, you know, I'm not going to get deeply into the, the uh, details of the quantum physics uh, aspects of this, uh, one can't complete the subject of black hole thermodynamics without talking about Hawking radiation and all of the implications that that has, which I think together with everything else here makes uh, black hole thermodynamics one of the, you know, more remarkable uh, developments in physics of the last half century or so. So I will get into all those issues in the last of the lectures. So I'm going to be starting with classical black holes, event horizons, and killing horizons. The, uh, most of the stuff that I'll say on that has to do with causal structure uh, would be found in chapters 8 and 9, and if not, the chapter on black holes, chapter 12 of my general relativity book. And again, almost everything that I'm going to say is in uh, a Living Reviews article uh, that I wrote also quite some time ago. Okay, so I want to start with the general notion of a horizon. And maybe I should not rush through this too quickly so that people are in the mood of, uh, of this. So, uh, we don't really need to talk about asymptotically flat space times or a special class of observers. If we have any observer, we can talk about the horizon of an observer. Uh, of an observer. But I'm only going to uh, uh, consider observable observers as well represented as inextendable time-like curves. So if I if we have a space-time diagram here, and you know, the board here is the space-time, uh, I'm not going to allow my observer to die suddenly of natural causes or whatever without something going wrong in the space-time. The observer will either live forever, uh, or maybe the observer will fall into a space-time singularity, but I'm going to demand that the observer is I mean, my demand is mathematical convenience for what I'm talking about. I'm going to demand that the observer is an inextendable time-like curve, right? If the observer just uh, suddenly died here at some event in space-time, you could extend that time-like curve. Uh, his or her child could go on as the observer, then uh, I'm not allowing this situation. Okay, and now uh, we can consider the causal past of any observer. That's the observer now is gamma. I minus of gamma is, I'm sorry, the chronological past. It doesn't really matter too much for what I'm 
about to, to define. So let me not, so I can consider all events that are connected to the observer by a time-like curve. And any event that's connected by a future-directed time-like curve to the observer world line is, uh, defines what I mean by the chronological past. And now the future horizon of the observer is going to be defined as the boundary of this chronological past. So in this case, where the observer falls into a singularity, there'll be some boundary that I've drawn with the dotted lines that has the property that inside of here you can reach, well, inside of here you can reach the observer with a time-like curve, but outside of here you can't. Uh, so that's going to be the general definition of a future horizon of an observer. And of course, uh, you could define past horizons in the same way. Now, just from this property, not using Einstein's equation or any uh, uh, results of that sort, it follows that each event that lies on this boundary that I've drawn uh, has to, in fact, lie on a null geodesic segment that's entirely contained within the boundary uh, and is future inextendable. I mean, there might be some, uh, you know, singular point here, that, uh, uh, this but the idea is that these observers can again, they're not observers, these are null geodesics now, can't just end suddenly. Uh, uh, I mean, this is just immediately following from the definition of the boundary. And I'll talk more about the convergence later, but I, uh, in a few minutes, but if we look at the boundary, and the boundary will be a null surface, it'll, in four-dimensional space-time, what I've drawn here as the line will be, in fact, a three-dimensional surface, null surface. Uh, it will be ruled by these null geodesics. Uh, there's a notion I will discuss further of the convergence of these null geodesics, and the convergence uh, can never become infinite at a point. You would have a, a caustic uh, in the congruence then. And the reason you can't have a caustic is if you did have a caustic, then when you go beyond it, you'd be able to connect uh, two points on that caustic by a time-like curve. But if you could connect them by a time-like curve, then you could find a point outside of here or an open neighborhood of this point that you could also connect to that event by a time-like curve, and that would contradict the, the statement that you were on the boundary. OK, so I just wanted to give, make sure everybody had a flavor of the kind of pictures that I'm going to draw and this uh, basic result. So just some examples. I mean, if we just have an inertial observer in Minkowski space-time, that observer can see everything uh, in, a, in his past, and he's also in the future of every event. Uh, so there are no past or future horizons of an inertial observer in Minkowski spacetime. But even if we stick to Minkowski spacetime, there are non-trivial notions of horizons. And if you have an observer that's uniformly accelerating for all time, in fact, this observer can't see anything uh, beyond this future horizon, H+, plus, which would be a null plane coming out of the board, again, if we were in four-dimensional uh, Minkowski space-time. And similarly, this uh, observer will have a past horizon. These two will be two null planes that intersect in that uh, two-surface. And if we have, if we consider Again, just to be in the mood of this, Minkowski space-time, but now uh, that little open circle there is supposed to mean I've just removed a point from the space-time. It's still a perfectly legal solution of Einstein's equation. 
uh, then I can have an observer going in to this non-existent point that will be an inextendable time-like uh, curve, uh, and it will have horizons that look uh, a future horizon uh, that I've sketched. You'll notice in this case, I mean, this will basically just be the past light cone of this would-be event without that event. The convergence is going to infinity uh, there, but it never reaches infinity, so it's all completely legal in terms of what I said. Okay, so now let's move on to black holes. So if we have, let's consider now an asymptotically flat space-time. Now one can give precise definitions of what I mean by asymptotic flatness. I do need it to be asymptotically flat in null directions, uh, not just initially in space-like directions. But the precise definition uh, isn't really important for this. I mean, it, it, any reasonable, any definition you can come up with of what you mean by asymptotically flat at large distances and also at late times uh, is fine. Uh, and we can consider in an asymptotically flat space time the observers who escape to arbitrarily large distances at late times. And we can look at the past of these observers. I mean, we can do these definitions for a family of observers just as well as a single observer. Or actually, in this case, I'm really fine even if I only consider a single observer that goes out to arbitrarily large uh, distances at, at late times in a suitable sense. I ha I'd have to be a little more restrictive in that, so why don't I consider all the whole family of observers. If the past of those observers is not the entire space-time, then we say that a black hole is present. And the definition of the black hole is the space-time minus the events, uh, apart from the events that are in the past of this family observers. And the horizon that I've just defined here, again, for this family of observers, would be called the future event horizon of the black hole. Now, this uh, definition doesn't say anything about bad things that might be happening outside the black hole. In fact, there could be singularities visible to these uh, observers. But an important notion in the theory of black holes and an important belief in terms of it being true, and if it isn't true, then a lot of the theory of black holes becomes, uh, uh, you know, irrelevant or, you know, not related to physics. Uh, but I certainly believe it's true, at least in some form. So, uh, so to explain what this cosmic censorship that's eliminating the no, na eliminating naked singularities is, I have to give a few more definitions. So this is a little heavy with uh, basic definitions here, but. So a Cauchy surface, by definition, is some, well, it'll have to be a three-dimensional surface, and it has to be a chronal. It could be null uh, as well as space-like, but let me consider a space-like uh, surface. So again, this is a space-time diagram here. So the, if this is the space-time, what I've drawn here will be said to be a Cauchy surface if it has the property that if I take any inextendable time-like curve, it has to be now inextendable in the past as well as the future. If that inextendable curve intersects what am I calling it, C. If that curve intersects C once and only once, well, only once means the surface is achronal, uh, but if every inextendable curve intersects that Cauchy surface, uh, that surface C that I've drawn, then it's said to be, uh, C is said to be a Cauchy surface for the space-time. Now, not every space-time admits a Cauchy surface, 
the ones that do admit a Cauchy surface are said to be globally hyperbolic. There are a number of other equivalent definitions of globally hyperbolic. I mean, non-trivially equivalent. It takes quite a bit of work to show they are all equivalent. Uh, one result uh, that follows, well, again, not immediately. There's quite a bit of argument involved, is that if you have a globally hyperbolic space-time with Cauchy surface C, then the topology of the space-time is simply R cross C. So this is sort of time cross C. And in fact, you can, if you have a Cauchy surface in, in a space-time, necessarily then globally hyperbolic by definition, then you can, in fact, foliate the entire space-time with Cauchy surfaces. I mean, again, that's, I'm not claiming any of these statements are obvious, any statements on this page are obvious, but I am claiming that they're true. Okay, so now that's the definition of a globally hyperbolic space-time. Now what this has to do with black holes and with cosmic censorship is the following. So we have Again, now in this asymptotically space-time, we have all these observers who are maybe out already at large distances, but at least they make it out to arbitrarily large distances at late times. But in the case I'm interested in, there are events in the space-time that they can't see. So there is a black hole. Uh, and this is the future event horizon, or the event horizon, I don't really have to say future, of the, of the black hole. So I, this is the case I'm interested in, since I'm, the, talk, the lectures are all on black hole thermodynamics. We are interested in the case where there's a black hole there. Okay, but the black hole is going to be said to be predictable, or in other words, there are no singularities outside the black hole or no naked singularities that would be visible to the observers out here, uh, if I can find uh, well, if I could find something that is a Cauchy surface for the exterior, including the event horizon and a little ways, it doesn't have to be far at all, but a little ways into the black hole. So the black hole is, the definition I'm giving is the black hole is said to be predictable if I can find some region of the space-time, well, there are too many dotted lines here, so let me get rid of that and use some other color chalk here. So if I can find, it doesn't end up here, so I, I'm just, but if I can find a region of the space-time, uh, it might end down here, because this black hole may have been formed by gravitational collapse, if I can find, and it doesn't end here, this is sort of infinity, uh, but if I can find a region of the space-time that includes the entire past of all these observers and the event horizon of the black hole, uh, such that that region itself is a globally hyperbolic space-time. So, again, there might be all kinds of nasty things going on inside here, that's fine. These nasty singularities that I'm drawing are not visible to these observers. Uh, this would be called a predictable uh, black hole space-time. And that is a precise expression of the idea that there aren't any naked singularities present. OK, so what does this have to do with cosmic censorship? Well, the, uh, if we start with asymptotically flat initial data, maybe way down here, uh, 
before there's been any gravitational collapse to form a black hole uh, or anything, the cosmic censorship conjecture uh, says that if I consider the maximal Cauchy evolution of, I'll make this my initial data surface C, so this is in line with Piotr Kruschel's initial data surface, and I would imagine he will talk about maximal Cauchy evolution as soon as I'm done uh, with this lecture in his, in his second lecture. So if, that, if this maximal Cauchy evolution, which automatically, by definition, is a globally hyperbolic space-time, uh, generically, you have to always put in generically because there are known counterexamples, and you have to also put in appropriate matter fields because you can do things with dust or fluids and so on that are not nice. But if the, if the maximal Cauchy evolution uh, extends long enough to give you, well, a complete null infinity, so these observers who are staying far away from all the gravitational collapse, uh, well, of course, they could accelerate out to infinity. They could accelerate also so fast that they only live a finite amount of time. Uh, I mean, they can't do that with a finite amount of fuel and all that, but, uh, uh, but if these observers near infinity who are essentially inertial, uh, if, I, if we consider observers near infinity who are essentially inertial, if they live forever, uh, then cosmic censorship uh, is said to be satisfied. It's formulated this way because wh what we're trying to, what one is trying to el eliminate in here is that you get some singularity outside the black hole. But if you got some singularity outside the black hole, then the domain of dependence or the, the maximal evolution of this data would not include anything to the future of this singularity. And then these observers would not live forever, even though they're behaving inertially at large distances. So this idea eliminates, is a precise and convenient, mathematically convenient way of formulating the idea that there are no naked singularities outside the black hole, but nothing is being restricted in terms of bad behavior inside the black hole. Okay, well this, I mean, uh, uh, Mahalas de Fermos will be talking uh, for a whole week on this and a somewhat related strong cosmic sensor hypothesis uh, next week, so I won't say anything further here about that, but I'm going to assume that this is valid or, if you like, restrict consideration in the rest of the lectures to predictable black holes, but I believe that every black hole is, that you'd form in nature is predictable, at least generically. Okay, so it might be worth spending a minute or two, uh, you know, before getting into more. Sorry. Uh, yes. Uh, asymptotically ADS, there would be no difference. Asymptotically de Sitter, then you'd really have to decide where you're, what, what observers you were considering with you know, in terms of uh, defining the black hole. I mean, the De Sitter space-time has a compact Cauchy surface, and it's sort of not obvious how you divide into what's inside the black hole and outside the black hole. But ADS, uh, if you, I mean, since I didn't give you the precise definition with null infinity, if you replace null infinity by the ADS boundary, there'd be no change whatsoever in the definitions. Okay, so it's worth uh, having a little bit of picture of a space-time diagram picture in mind of what is going on in gravitational collapse that results in a space-time like I've sketched here, 
though it's a little, I think this way gives a, a drawing it this way gives a, a bit of a clearer picture of what the black hole uh, or, or sort of the localization of the black hole than this diagram, though this diagram, which I'll show you again in the next figure, gives a much clearer picture of what the horizon and singularity look like, at least in the spherically symmetric case. So I'm showing the simplest example of spherically symmetric collapse, which one really knows everything relevant about exactly because exterior to any spherically symmetric collapsing matter is the Schwarzschild solution, and we know how the Schwarzschild solution behaves. So here I've shown collapsing matter. These are spherical, this semicircular looking line there is the spherical outer surface of a star or some other collapsing matter. And that matter just collapses down to zero radius, where I possibly should put radius in quotes. It's not in quotes in terms of telling you area of spheres. It's certainly in quotes in terms of sort of suggesting that it's an origin of coordinates. I'll, I'll show you that in the next uh, diagram. Uh, and all the matter falls into a singularity is created when r equals zero is reached and all the matter falls into that singularity and disappears forever. Uh, the only way in this diagram you can tell that there's a black hole here is if I draw in the light cones, which in this way of representing things are all tilted over toward the singularity when you're near the singularity. And what this is telling you is that any observer at this event is going to fall into the singularity, and any light ray at this event is going to fall into the singularity. So any observer out here uh, is not going to see anything coming from an event, well, inside this dotted cylinder as I've drawn it here. Uh, on the other hand, if you're far enough away uh, from the singularity, then you don't have any problem sending light signals out to an observer. So this event is not inside the black hole. The boundary uh, shown here is the event horizon. Now, I think that gives a sort of clear, clear physical picture of sort of the collapse, but it doesn't, but the light cones are all tilted over. We can redraw this, and it'll look much more like what I've drawn here, uh, but only if we suppress, I, I don't know of any nice way of drawing this without suppressing all the angular directions, uh, but if you do that, so we're down to just the sort of radius and time, in quotes, a two-dimensional uh, space-time where each point in this space-time that I've drawn here is, is actually a two-sphere, uh, then I can straighten out the light cones. And you can see easily in this picture that the event horizon is a null surface, as it better be. I, it's ruled by null geodesics. Uh, what you can see much more clearly in this picture is that the singularity inside the black hole, though I'm not going to be worried too much about anything going on inside the black hole in these lectures, but that's space-like uh, in the case of this spherical gravitational collapse. And you can sort of see why you can't send light signals out to distant observers here, because all the observers and their light rays will eventually fall into the singularity. The singularity is a kind of end of time. OK, so now I want to get on to, well, first major result that will be interpreted as the second law of black hole thermodynamics, the analog of entropy increase. And I already alluded to the uh, uh, convergence uh, or expansion, I guess is what I'm defining here. The, Expansion is minus the convergence uh, of 
the null geodesic, well, this could actually be an arbitrary congruence of null geodesics. They don't even, at the moment, for what I'm writing down, they don't even have to be surface forming, but I just have null geodesics filling up space time. Uh, and if I, uh, so I'll let their tangent, the, I'll let them be affinely parametrized and their tangent with that affine parametrization be k. And then the space-time divergence of k is what I'm defining to be the expansion. So if they're diverging in this precise sense, then the null geodesics are expanding. Now, if we uh, consider, uh, well, uh, an area element that uh, let's, let's consider now, since I'm going to restrict to that almost immediately anyway, the, just the null geodesics generating a null hypersurface. Uh, the, this doesn't take any derivatives off the hypersurface, in fact, so this is still perfectly well defined, even if we have null geodesics only generating a hypersurface. And if I imagine, so again, in four space-time dimensions, the null hypersurface is three-dimensional, a cross-section will be two-dimensional, and if I look at an infinitesimal area element that is carried along by these null geodesics, then in fact, the expansion as I've defined it here uh, is just the derivative with respect to affine parameter of the log of the area carried by these uh, area of an element carried uh, along by these null geodesics. Now, again, if the null geodesics generate a hypersurface, the so-called twist, which would be the anti-symmetrized derivative, so if I uh, had these indices be different and anti-symmetrized, that would uh, essentially define the notion of the twist, but if they're surface forming, the twist will, in fact, vanish. And when the twist vanishes, uh, there's a remarkable equation that underlies 90% of global arguments in general relativity, uh, the Rechaduri equation, uh, which is just basically a version of the geodesic deviation equation for the congruence, which it's just a formula that relates the Ricci curvature, which is what's going to come in when you average over the geodesics. I mean, the Riemann tensor comes into the geodesic deviation equation, but when you average uh, uh, over them to get the area element instead of just the geodesic uh, deviation vector, uh, the Ricci tensor comes in, and the Ricci tensor is related, this is just, this is not using Einstein's equation or anything else, this is just basic differential geometry of null congruences. It's related to the expansion and the shear. There would have been a, a term if I had the twist in there that would come in with opposite sign and spoil any argument, but we're interested in the case where these are surface forming. Uh, so you, you get this formula, well, it's really a formula, well, it's the geodesic deviation equation averaged over the null geodesic surrounding the one that you're following. Uh, and what's absolutely remarkable about this equation is if Einstein's equation holds, and this is one of the few places where I'm directly using Einstein's equation, with uh, a stress energy tensor that satisfies positive energy. In fact, all we need, uh, I mean, positive energy would, positive energy density as viewed by any observer would be saying, or non negative energy density as viewed by any time like observer would say this for any time like curve. We, we don't even need that, we just need this to be true for null curves. Yeah? 
Oh, okay, yeah, or maybe I'll write it more toward the middle. Anyway, the condition that So if this were true for any time-like vector by continuity, it would be true for any null vector. But we only need this, in fact, to be true for uh, null vectors. In fact, if you have a cosmological constant, uh, it's quite important that you're only needing this for uh, null vectors, because then the cosmological constant contribution, which is proportional to the metric, doesn't enter at all. So it's this holds for both signs of cosmological constant. So if that holds and Einstein's equation holds, then this term is non-negative. Uh, this term is manifestly non-negative. Uh, uh, well, this term, yeah, with a minus sign here. OK, we get an inequality immediately from this. This also has a definite sign, but I want to keep that term. Uh, we get this remarkably simple inequality, which you can also write as the lambda derivative of 1 over theta uh, is less than or equal to, or, yeah, is less than or equal to 1, uh, or 1 half, or whatever uh, the right uh, algebraic uh, yeah, expression is. Yeah, I guess it'll be a half. Uh, so you can integrate that inequality and get this result. Well, what's remarkable about this result is that it says that if you initially have negative expansion, so you're converging, then, in fact, 1 over theta is going to have to go to 0 within a finite affine parameter. That means the expansion uh, uh, I think I may have a sign mistake in this. Uh, no, it's the, this thing is negative, so this goes to 0. That means the expansion goes to minus, it's correct as written, the expansion goes to minus infinity at a finite affine parameter. OK, so one immediate consequence of that, well, you can do better by improving this argument, as I'm indicating here, is if we look at the event horizon uh, of a black hole, uh, it's a horizon. It can't have infinitely negative expansion at any point along that. So if, you, if one were to assume, which there's no reason really to do, but we can do better than this, as I'll explain in a second, if we assume that the horizon generators are complete, it means that all of these generators have to be expanding because if they started, if they were converging anywhere, they would converge infinitely in finite affine parameter, which would contradict this being a horizon. Well, that argument is not really optimal because the horizon generators might not be complete. The predictability assumption doesn't guarantee that the uh, horizon generators are complete. But you can actually make a nicer argument by arguing if the expansion were negative somewhere, then you could deform the horizon there outward so that it would be visible at infinity, but you'd still have negative expansion. But now, because it's visible at infinity, you'll run into a similar contradiction in, the, in this manner. So that leads to the following result, which I should probably draw a picture of. I think I can just do it under here. So if we have the event horizon of a black hole here, as I'm drawing, uh, and we have some initial Cauchy surface for the exterior region, including the horizon, which we do, assuming we have a predictable black hole, which we will have for sure if cosmic censorship is true. So this will intersect the horizon in some cross-section, which uh, I don't know if I gave the name S1 to. 
And if we go to some later time, some later Cauchy surface in the foliation, and look at the intersection of that Cauchy surface with the horizon, that will be some surface S2. Uh, and now there are two things going on that go in the same direction. The, the generators uh, of the horizon are, uh, sorry, I shouldn't have said future complete. I should have said future inextendable. So every null generator that was on the horizon here will continue up and still be on the horizon there. Now, there may be new null generators that form in between, but the consequence is that the area of, the, of this surface here, A2, write that big because this is important, the area A2 of the surface here is going to be bigger than the area of the surface down here for any two surfaces, well, for two reasons. There are the, there are the null geodesics that came from here, but those have positive expansion, so they're carrying at least as much area. And then there may be new null geodesics uh, that arise here. That's only going to add to the area even more. There aren't any null geodesics that were down here that didn't make it up to here on the event horizon because of these basic properties of horizons that I discussed uh, you know, in the first five or 10 minutes of, of the talk. Okay, so that gives the area theorem, the surface area of the event horizon of a, black, of a predictable black hole never decreases with time. Okay, now I'm gonna switch gears to what ought to appear initially like a completely different topic, but everything will get tied together. I hope by the end of this uh, talk, I guess I still have another half hour, so there's a reasonable shot at that. So I'm gonna now talk about symmetries and, well, an isometry is just a diffeomorphism that when you carry the metric along with that diffeomorphism, the metric goes into itself. So it's a symmetry, and if you have a one-parameter group of diffeomorphisms, you'll have a vector field generator of it, uh, and that generator is called the uh, killing vector field uh, with a capital K for the name of the person. It's not murdering any, anything particularly, even though it is kind of killing the metric and so the change of the metric in some sense. And the equation of a killing vector field is just that the symmetrized covariant derivative of the killing field with its index lowered by the metric uh, is zero. Now, uh, yeah, let me denote the, so the symmetrized first derivative is automatically zero, so the only thing for first derivatives that comes in is the anti-symmetrized first derivative, and let me use capital F to denote that. Now, a very important property of killing vector fields and isometries is that they're, they're completely determined by, well, the killing vector field in particular is completely determined by knowing at a single point P, the value of the killing vector field and the value of its first derivative. Now that may sound remarkable, but if, you know, uh, if I give you a, I can figure out where the isometry is gonna move every other point from this information one can see because I can connect, uh, well, Let's imagine, just for the sake of simplicity, that I can connect every other point to P by a geodesic. That's not necessarily true, but, that, but you can modify this argument slightly to... So if I want to know where, how does an isometry... So here is my fixed point P, here's my other arbitrary point. 
if I want to know uh, where does this point go under the isometry, all I have to figure out is what happens to the geodesic that connected them. But to figure out what happens to the geodesic, all I need to know is what happened to the tangent to the geodesic uh, at this, the starting point. But to figure out what happened to the tangent to the geodesic, uh, well, okay, I, 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 let's consider the case where I don't move point P either. So the killing field vanishes at P. Sorry for garbling this argument. Uh, if the killing vector vanishes at P, then where the geodesic goes is completely determined by the derivative uh, of the killing field, because that's sort of telling you what happens at the tangent space at P. And then you can figure out where the isometry goes. Anyway, that was a bit garbled, but that was uh, just giving a uh, explanation of why it's not completely insane that killing vector fields are completely determined by the va their value at a given point and the value of the derivative at that point. So let me now consider the case that I was already jumping ahead to consider uh, in what I was uh, just talking about uh, to the case, well, let's restrict to two dimensions. I'll go up in dimension easily in a little, in a moment. But let's consider the case where, the, where a killing field vanishes at some point P. Here's the point P. Then uh, the anti-symmetrized derivative in two dimensions has to be proportional to the volume element at P. So, the, so in fact, the killing field is unique up to scaling. There can't be more than one killing field up to scaling that vanishes at P. And you can easily figure out what goes on. I mean, you can figure out easily what goes on in the tangent space. This corresponds to an infinitesimal rotation. But that means that also goes on in the space-time, if you follow along with geodesics. So if we have a Riemannian metric, I'm interested in the Lorentzian case, uh, any killing field that vanishes at a point is going to have an orbit structure like what I'm drawing here. It's going to be a rotation, and this will be the rotation axis, a rotation point, since we're only in, in two dimensions. I think everyone is familiar with this. What I find somewhat outrageous is in the Lorentzian case, most people, I mean, who have not gotten deeply into general relativity, I mean, this should be, you know, a major, if, if there's going to be like a course or several weeks on special relativity, I mean, it's, it's hard to imagine a course on Euclidean geometry where you wouldn't introduce the notion of a, of a rotation uh, and draw this kind of picture for what a rotation looks like. Uh, well, this is the corresponding picture in Lorentzian geometry. So if you have a killing field that vanishes at a point, then in the tangent space, this is again just two-dimensional, uh, the, the symmetry is a Lorentz boost. And this is the orbit. This is what I find outrageous, that people don't automatically know what the orbit structure of Lorentz boosts are. So it's the Lorentzian analog of a rotation. But now these orbits are not closed. They're not you know, compact or anything. They have an orbit structure where they're, for the sign of the killing field that I'm choosing, they're future directed in this sort of right wedge, past directed in this left wedge, space-like in the direction shown in these future and past wedges. And the killing field is null on these horizons that I'll, they're not, at the moment, horizons in the sense I introduced them, they are going to be killing horizons uh, in the sense that I, uh, so the, the, the killing fields are null and generate two intersecting null surfaces that vanish at this point where I, you know, where, which was the special point where the killing field vanishes. So now if we go up to four dimensions or whatever dimensions you want, uh, if we, make the killing field vanish on a, uh, 
co-dimension two surface, uh, uh, we get similar results. And the case I'm interested in is where we have a Lorentzian metric and this co-dimension two surface is space-like. Then again, the orbit structure near that surface is going to be just like this. And the pair of intersecting null surfaces that you automatically get from this uh, is what I'll call a bifurcate killing horizon. Uh, the killing field is then normal. Now, normal means tangent for a null surface. I mean, normal implies tangent. Uh, in fact, tangent precisely implies tangent to the null geodesic generators of the horizon. So this, in this bifurcate killing horizon case, the killing field is tangent to both of these horizons. More generally, if we have any null surface that has the property that a killing field is normal to it, I will call that a killing horizon. OK, so now uh, I, for a killing horizon, an arbitrary killing horizon, it doesn't have to be a bifurcate killing horizon, one can introduce the notion of surface gravity. Uh, it's convenient uh, uh, to introduce an affine parameterization of the null geodesics, I mean an arbitrary affine parameterization of them. And I'll let capital U denote uh, the affine uh, parameter of them. And we can also parameterize the null geodesics by the killing parameter. I don't seem to have defined little u anywhere here. But uh, uh, the killing parameter is defined by the derivative along, uh, I mean, this is also a derivative along the null geodesics, but I've normalized the null tangent to be the killing field here. And this isn't equal to 0. This would be equal to 1. So that defines the killing parameterization, the affine parameterization. Uh, Again, let's have that be one, uh, would be defined by, you know, moving along uniformly in time with respect to the affinely parametrized tangent. Uh, well, both of these, both the affinely parametrized null geodesic tangent and the killing field are uh, tangent to the same null geodesic. So, they're proportional to each other by some function of proportionality on the horizon. The surface gravity is defined, well, as I've written it here, uh, uh, as the derivative of the log of this uh, proportionality function with respect to the killing parameter. Uh, a better way of thinking about it is that the surface gravity is telling you how non-affinely parametrized the null geodesics parametrized by killing parameter are. Kappa, I mean, if C was the affinely parametrized tangent, then the geodesic equation would be telling you this is zero. But if it's non-affinely parametrized, then it's proportional to the tangent, and kappa is the function of proportionality. Well, because C is a killing field, it immediately follows that kappa has to be constant along each null geodesic generator. But in principle, kappa could vary from generator to generator. Uh, now, because it's constant on each generator, there's you can integrate, uh, well, F is that and, you know, kappa is that and kappa is independent of little u or capital U. Uh, so you can immediately integrate to get the relationship between the killing parameterization of the null geodesics 
and the affine parameterization, uh, and you get this exponential relationship. So actually notice that when the killing parameter runs over its full range of minus infinity to infinity, the affine, if the kappa is non-zero, the affine parameterization is only going to run over a half line. Uh, there's the reason for the name surface gravity uh, comes from the following formula that's not, uh, takes a few lines uh, to show with manipulations using Killing's equation and so on. Uh, if, if you look at the, if you were to normalize the, okay, outside, I, I guess let me back up e even one more slide. So for, at least for a, a bifurcate killing horizon, although now we're talking about general killing horizons, but I'm gonna relate that to bifurcate horizons very soon. Uh, the orbits are time-like in a wedge outside the horizon. I can look at the, I can look at, you know, unit norm observers following these orbits and look at their acceleration. That acceleration is gonna diverge as I uh, approach the horizon. It's very hard for observer, time-like observers to move like null objects on the horizon uh, without the acceleration going to infinity. But the norm of the killing field also goes to zero, and it's not hard to show that the product of these two is the surface gravity. Now, the acceleration of a time-like object like this, I'm not gonna drop it, uh, on the surface of the Earth. Well, only the people familiar with general relativity understand that this thing is accelerating right now. If I were to drop it, it would not be accelerating. So the acceleration of this object is, if it were unit mass, or if you divide by the mass, is what in freshman physics you call the surface gravity. Surface gravity defined that way for a black hole without the redshift factor would be infinity, but the surface gravity is what I, the finite answer that I was talking about. Well, we haven't connected black hole horizons with killing horizons yet either, so I am kind of jumping around a bit. Uh, but anyway, that uh, product of the redshift factor and the acceleration is uh, acceleration of the killing orbits times the norm of the killing field limit as to the horizon does give you the surface gravity. Okay, so as I said, in principle, the surface gravity could vary from generator to generator. The zeroth law of black hole thermodynamics, which is the analog of the zeroth law of thermodynamics, zeroth law of thermodynamics in case your course started with the first law or something, uh, is the statement that the temperature is uniform for a body in equilibrium. Okay, well, the zeroth law is that, is basically the statement that the surface gravity is constant, well, on the event horizon of a black hole, but we haven't gotten to that yet because that isn't a killing horizon yet. It's about to be. Sorry for the disjointed versions of what I'm uh, telling you. So there are, in fact, three separate independent results that talk about the constancy of the surface gravity uh, on the horizon. So the first one is that if you have a, uh, any killing horizon at all, in a space-time where you have Einstein's equation with the dominant energy condition now, so that's a stronger energy condition than the null energy condition. Uh, if that is the case, then the surface gravity has to be constant on this killing horizon. This is actually a fairly non-trivial, I mean, this takes a page or two to prove. It's not entirely uh, straightforward. It's 
So any killing horizon that arises in general relativity where matter satisfies dominant energy condition is going to have constant surface gravity. There are a couple of other versions of this law that actually uh, don't use Einstein's equation but make other assumptions. Uh, if you have a uh, killing horizon where either the killing field is hypersurface orthogonal, the static case, uh, so this is in four dimensions that I'm stating this for, uh, at least with respect to the second condition, or you have a second killing field, you have axisymmetry, uh, that second killing field commutes with the original one, uh, uh, and, well, you have a reflection isometry with respect to the two killing fields, then, in fact, uh, you can show the surface gravity has to be constant. So that's a little more complicated, and a, but it doesn't use uh, Einstein's equation. I think it doesn't use Einstein's equation. The third one definitely doesn't use Einstein's equation, which is, is if you have a bifurcate killing horizon, then it's actually fairly straightforward to show that the surface gravity has to be constant. That does not use Einstein's equation at all. OK, but now uh, with one additional result, I, I, uh, hopefully I'll have time for questions if I'm confusing people with the array of things that I'm throwing at you right now. Uh, but hopefully this is reasonably clear. Uh, if you have a bifurcate killing horizon, then, I, as I just said, the surface gravity is constant. But it's also possible to show, again, not using Einstein's equation, that uh, if the uh, surface gravity uh, is constant, uh, so you don't know that it's a bifurcate killing horizon, but if the surface gravity is constant and non-zero, then, in fact, the horizon must be essentially a bifurcate killing horizon. I mean, maybe, only, maybe somebody only gave you one portion of the bifurcate killing horizon, not including the bifurcation surface. So maybe, for starters, somebody just gave you a space time that contained this fourth of a bifurcate killing horizon, but the claim is, here that it really it was a bifurcate horizon. You could always extend the space time if necessary to make it a bifurcate killing horizon. So since by Einstein, using Einstein's equation, only killing horizons with constant surface gravity will arise, uh, this statement says that given that the surface gravity is constant, the only cases that really need to be considered are the cases of a bifurcate killing horizon and, <clears throat> and the case where the surface gravity is zero. That will not correspond to a bifurcate killing horizon. So only these so-called degenerate horizons are the only ones that we really have to concern ourselves with with, with respect to killing horizons uh, in general relativity. OK, so now what does this have to do with the first half of what I was talking about with event horizons? Because I've only been talking about killing horizons. Well, the major result that ties the two together is what's often referred to, or usually referred to, as the Hawking rigidity theorem. So if you have a stationary black hole, so more precisely, a stationary asymptotically flat space-time. Again, you've got to have appropriate matter. It really it certainly needs hyperbolic equations and so on describing the matter that contains a black hole. Then, in fact, the event horizon of the black hole, so the thing I was drawing here and showing you pictures of early on, when the black hole is stationary, but 
one would expect it will asymptotically approach a stationary final state. So this should be describing station, final states, asymptotic final states of black holes. The event horizon uh, uh, has to be a killing horizon. So there has to be a killing field orthogonal to the event horizon of a stationary black hole. Okay, so, right, and given what I just said, because of the constancy of the surface gravity, it further imply, it follows immediately that uh, the black holes we need to consider in general relativity are ones whose asymptotic final states can be described by bifurcate killing horizons together with these black holes with zero surface gravity. And most of what I'll be talking about in the next lecture and so on will be considering these asymptotic final states of black holes that have a bifurcate killing horizon. Okay, so an important implication of this is, well, there are really two cases when I say the event horizon has to be a killing horizon, of course, that means there's a killing field orthogonal to the, to the horizon. Well, I assume that there was a killing field already when I said we had a stationary black hole. So there are two possibilities. Maybe the killing field uh, is, in fact, uh, the, the killing field that's normal to the horizon must be, uh, maybe, one possibility, one, is it's the killing field that we already started with. In that case, by further arguments, one can show that, in fact, that killing field is hypersurface orthogonal, meaning the black hole is, in fact, static. There's a time reflection symmetry associated with it, as well as the time translation symmetry. And that's important because for black hole uniqueness, uh, Israel had, before this theorem, uh, before the Hawking result, had already uh, proven that the Schwarzschild black holes are the only static uh, black holes. If, it's, if the original killing field is not normal to H, to the horizon, that means there's another killing field around, and it can further then be shown that some linear combination of the killing fields has to have uh, clo space-like closed orbits. So in other words, if the black hole is rotating, because if the stationary killing field isn't the one that points along the null generators, one would naturally say the horizon is rotating, uh, then in fact the a rotating black hole has to be axisymmetric. And so you can choose the normalization of the horizon killing field, so it's the stationary killing field plus some multiple, constant multiple of the axial killing field, and this is the angular velocity of the horizon that Nico, uh, that came up, uh, well, in several contexts in Nico's uh, talk this morning. So, this is what the idealized kind of continued general black hole, stationary black hole state, well, general except for the case of the zero surface gravity black holes. Uh, you'll have a region outside here of time translation uh, 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 with the orbits of the time translation symmetry. The original time-like uh, killing field may go space-like near the horizon, as Nico also discussed, giving an ergo region here. And then in this continued space-time, you'll have the black hole region, but you also can continue it to a white hole region and a, and a new universe. I mean, if you've seen the Kruskal diagram for Schwarzschild, that's uh, this the general black hole with a bifurcate killing horizon will have a similar structure, not necessarily up here with the singularity, but with the horizon. Uh, that may look weird, but of course, this is just what's going on in Minkowski space time relative to Lorentz boosts. I've already shown you the orbits of Lorentz boost symmetry 
they look the same. And one thing to very much keep in mind with black holes is if you consider a very large black hole, the curvature, I'm picking a particularly large one, uh, curvature at the horizon is smaller than the curvature in this room. So an observer uh, who falls into a black hole would hardly be able to tell that he or she is not in Minkowski space time and you know, falling, if you like, through a killing horizon, uh, perhaps. Uh, I mean, we're all falling through killing horizons right now, right at this moment, if we approximate our space time as Minkowski. I mean, you really should not be able to tell by any local measurements that you're not in Minkowski space time. Of course, uh, a few weeks later, this observer is very much going to notice uh, that he or she is not in Minkowski space time, and it's going to be far too late to do anything about it. Uh, OK, so I am at the summary slide, so it looks like I'm actually going to finish this on time. So let me, since there were a few parts of this that sounded a little incoherent to me, let me uh, uh, summarize uh, everything together. So if cosmic censorship holds, then starting with any non-singular initial data, at least generically, uh, if you have gravitational collapse that is, you know, will form a singularity, I mean, Penrose theorem and other singularity theorems will guarantee you that under conditions where you form the trap surface, which I haven't talked about here. All the singularities uh, will be hidden in a black hole, and your space-time outside the black hole will remain perfectly predictable. The uh, area of the event horizon of a black hole is, will be non-decreasing with time. If you form a black hole, it would be natural to expect that, in fact, rather quickly, I mean, time scale of milliseconds uh, for a solar mass sort of black hole, uh, will quite quickly asymptotically approach what you might call an equilibrium final state in the thermodynamic analogy. I think the equilibrium is a good term, but a stationary final state. Uh, this final stationary black hole, the event horizon of, of it, will be a killing horizon, will have constant surface gravity. And if it has non-zero surface gravity, it can be extended to have bifurcate killing horizon structure. OK, that's it for what I wanted to say. <laughs>